Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. My name is Travis, and I serve as the lead pastor here, and that's uh, potentially something I need to say because I haven't spoken in like six weeks. Is that right? One of my favorite things to hear, one of the most encouraging pieces of feedback I get is, I did not know you were the senior pastor. It it encourages me, uh, actually, because we've got so many gifted people able to teach and, and lead, and it's a joy um, to steward and, and, and serve here. So um, I get a lot of opportunities um, to serve elsewhere, especially in church plants. Um, I don't do this on the side, like I've got a side gig consulting church plants, Um, It's actually a part of my job here at Radiant and part of what the leaders have released me to do. So I just came from Tulare, uh, where I spoke uh, this morning because it's a significant morning in Tulare because they're installing elders, a significant marker for them and their journey of being established as a church there in Tulare. Um, Two weeks ago, I actually had the opportunity to be in San Francisco uh, helping Tom Shaw, who's a part of our family, and up there planting a church. So this is part of what I get to do is roam around and serve. And I get a lot of opportunities, and I get a lot of attention because I, I successfully started this. I, I, I planted this church, and because it, it worked, people think that I know what I'm doing. And people think that I can help. And uh, I do have some ideas around what works and uh, what doesn't work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I still feel uh, genuinely just... Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that, <laughs> that this worked. <laughs> so anyways, I get invited to be the expert, and uh, I, I step in, and because I get invited to step in and, and get treated like the expert, and because this attention and because these opportunities come my way, I'm tempted like any human being would be tempted to think that this started and worked because I was exceptionally gifted, that my, my wife and I were, were called of God and we were the, the business and, and this is why uh, this worked. That's like a, a temptation. But over the years of traveling and over the years of supporting church plants and over the years of stepping into situations that are working and stepping into situations that are not working, not just in this state, but in other states and in other countries, one thing has become really clear to me. This did not go because I was gifted. This went because I had an exceptional team. I had a committed core of people around me that most church planters would die for. That's what made this. I'm tempted to think, oh, it's, it, you know, it's probably my wife and I, you know, and the truth is, as I travel, I feel really clear. We had a really gifted group of people deeply bought into the vision and captured by the idea of a thriving local church that was obedient to God's word and filled with the power of the spirit. Here's a photo of what would be like Mount Rushmore. This is not everyone, but this is 
most of our team. If, if you look a little closer on the good projector, this projector is not good. Uh, if you look at the good projector, you can see that Tiffany's pregnant. Surprise, surprise. You, you'll see Matt San Pietro without gray hair. That's Eric and Ben with hair. If you didn't recognize them, they have hair, not on their faces, but on their heads. This is 2004, so Alicia has a scarf. <laughs> and all the gals have like a deep side part. And if you're here and you're like, I still have a side part. What's the problem with the side part? Come talk to this group over here and ask them, what's wrong with side parts? I still have a side part. So I would add a few other people, Lindsay Baldwin and Cat and Heath and Mike and Katie, and there'd be a few others, but, but this is the dream team. And this is, this is what this uh, team began to do in order to make this happen. This is what, it's, it's not like secret sauce. It was pretty easy to come up with this week. This team made great sacrifices. Most of us are willing to give until it hurts. And there is usually a small group of people that are committed to give even when it hurts. When it costs. They're still willing to pay. And that's what made them the dream team is that they gave sacrificially. And it's what built this church, and furthermore, it's what built, what has built the church historically, is a bunch of people willing to pay in blood. Now, none of that group, thankfully, was martyred. But what I mean is, they didn't pull out when they began to get pinched. They pressed in. They continued to give, even when it cost, even when it hurt. So it wasn't uncommon for this team to say things like this. Yes, I just had twins, but I'll serve on kids. I'll serve your kids. I have not slept, but I'll serve your kids. It wasn't uncommon for this team to say, yes, I'm launching a new company. I don't know actually if work is going to work out but I will not stop working on the website because I also want to launch this church. It wasn't uncommon for this team to say things like, yeah, I have to work at 3 a.m., but if you want to stay at my house till 11 p.m. because you sleep till 3 p.m., then my doors are open to hear about your life and the challenges that you face. And I know that you've done this. I'm not saying that these are, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I, I, I know that the, these people are not the only ones who have done this. I know that you've experienced this. I know that you potentially serve in this way. Because this is what, this is what makes our companies. This is what makes our countries. This is what makes our families. This is what makes our campuses. And many of you feel like there are many areas of life in which you're serving in this way. Like when it hurts, you continue to give. And when it costs, you continue to give sacrificially. And I want to say this, make no mistake, that when I say hurt, when I say cost, <laughs> I want you to know that this is the best way to go to church. That this is not just pain, this is privilege to serve in these ways. And if you're not doing home like this, you're not doing work like this, you're not doing church like this, then what I want to say actually is that you're missing out. Because it turns out that those that give the most 
end up getting the most out of things because usually value is determined by participation. And as we sink ourselves into something, we receive. And if you don't believe me, you can trust Jesus who said, if you try to save your life, guess what? You'll lose it. And if you lose your life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you'll find the life that's truly life. You'll find deep meaning, even in the pain and the pursuit of this. Can I tell you another, like, I walked, you know, 10 miles to school in the snow uphill story. Is that all right? I am the senior pastor, so allow me to have a senior moment. Just reminisce a little bit. It was uphill. It was cold. I want to take you way back. 2019. Remember 2019? That might as well have been like another era. 2019 is like the 70s or something along those lines. This is, we're talking about pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic days. And it feels like a long time ago. And I'm aware that everyone's uh, walked through a lot and probably still traumatized and wounded by what we've just walked through together. 2019, I used to sit around with these pastor buddies, and we used to talk. And you know what we'd talk about? We'd talk about uh, what is kind of called the 80-20 rule. And you'll see this in a lot of different fields or kind of areas. But in church, what we meant when we said 80-20 is that 80% of the work is being done by 20% of the people. And we would sit and we would strategize. I wonder how we could catch people up in what we're doing. I wonder how we could move beyond 20%. I wonder how we could see every member ministry happen in our churches. We would love to see more than 20% of the church engaged in serving and participating in what we're doing. March 2020 hits. And what was... 80% of the work being done by 20% of the people here in the church becomes 95% of what we're doing being done by 5% of the people here because who we are together shuts down. All of the opportunities to serve are reduced to me and Forrest walking out into an orchard and making a video that we broadcast Uh, into your home. That's the expression of our togetherness. Now, thankfully, many of you kept giving, and so many of our staff were able to stay on. So Sean's here receiving the money. Uh, Mike's here trying to keep things going, and I'm doing my best to become a televangelist. But what happens is that 95% of kind of who we are and what we do together begins to be done by an even smaller group of people. The bottom line is over the course of the pandemic, what happens here on the stage didn't necessarily suffer. Our ministry in the word and kind of the worship that was coming at you didn't suffer, but our serve culture and our assimilation connection into this church was decimated uh, by the pandemic. And we have to get, we have to get back. We have to, listen, the thing I used to complain about, I'm now like, if I could only have that. Does anybody else have that right now in your job where you're like, I used to complain about that. And now I'm like, that's a goal in my life. If I could just get back to 80% of the work being done by 20% of the people, I'd be so helpful. We, We just have to get back to that. Not because that's even close to ideal, but because that's the baseline for us to operate. We're starting to move in that direction 10% of those who are active in our church are serving in some capacity, but we have to move beyond five and beyond 10 to at least get to 20% of those who are active in our church serving in some way in order to facilitate 
this expression of who we are together. So over the last three months here at Radiant, 1,647 people have participated in something uh, that our church is doing. And so we're needing 329 people engaged in serving uh, here in our church. That's worship, sound, slides, kids, in order to make our mornings work. There's a lot of different people who are working. And like I said, right now, 10% of our church is engaged. So we've got 160 people out of the 1,600 serving in some way, 160.4. I don't know who the point four is, but you need to step up your contribution around here. <laughs> You're a decimal of a person here. Let's stay in the math because I got glasses. Number of members who've served in the last six months. In the last six months, the number of members who have served is, is 90. That's 38% of our membership. In the last four months, 76 members have served. That's 32% of our membership. In the last two months, it's down to 62 of our members. That's 26% of our membership. That is people who said, I'm with you and you can count on me to serve. 26% of them are actually doing that. Here's the problem uh, with what's happening is that our attendance is back up, but our committed core is not. We're back to pre-pandemic numbers, but our serve culture is still at uh, 10%. So I'm going to ask you to do a few things in order to make this work. I'm guessing if you're here, you enjoy this. Maybe you don't say that, but you kind of vote with your feet. You think there's some purpose in uh, being here. I'm guessing you like participating in, in what's happening. So I just want to ask you, uh, to do a few things as we go forward together. The first thing is this. I want to ask you to attend regularly. And you might be thinking, wait, Trav, I thought you said there was a problem, and that is that attendance is up and the serve culture is not, or the committed core is not in place to serve those who are coming. And that is, that is true. But I think this all stems back to attendance, Here's, here's what I mean. The majority of our church comes twice a month. So when you're asked to serve once a month, that's half the time you're here. Many, many people come once a month. So when you're asked to serve, you're asked to serve 100% of the time that you're here. And what you say is, I just don't want to miss out on what's happening here. Well, then don't miss out on what's happening here. Don't miss out on what's happening here. Don't solve that problem of serving 100% of the time by not serving. Fix that problem by attending regularly. Come. Come. Every week. You can do it. It makes a difference. It does. I'm not guilting you. Your presence here makes a difference that you show up ready to connect, ready to worship, ready to sit under and respond to God's word, it makes a difference. If the pandemic taught us anything, it was that this is significant. This is significant, what we do together. I can't tell you the carnage that came to us because we weren't doing this together. Come, come regularly. Well, I lost my place. So many, you know, sorry, now I'm on a, now I'm on a soapbox. I just, I just, so many, so many people pushed me to open the doors. Why? So that you could come quarterly? So that you could come in the fall? Well, I, I'll get my fall service in, get my winter service in, and probably had your way in the spring, catch you on summer. You know, like, 
Why? So many people, hey, don't let the state tell you what to do. Jesus is the head of the church. Cool. Don't let the 49ers schedule tell you what to do. Jesus is the Lord of your life, your whole life. That's cool. Don't let your kid's soccer schedule tell you what to do. Jesus is the head coach, and they're probably not going to play in college, but you're going to wish they went to church in college. Don't let the almighty dollar determine what you're going to do. Jesus is your treasure. He's what you want. He's what you long for. And we find him here together. This is significant what we do. And I'm not trying to get legalistic here. But legalism is not our problem. Legalism is not our problem. License is. Cheap grace is. Consumerism is. Just a generation ago, you went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and you didn't miss. Attend regularly. And then a portion of that, you, 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 you can serve. There's no formation in our lives without repetition. Doing this week in and week out forms us, it shapes us. The second thing I'm gonna, we're resurrecting is this idea that you would attend one and serve the other. That was where we started when we started two services. We're going back to two services, but this is where we started, and slowly over time, we've fallen away from this. So I know that there are valuable things that happen here. I know you don't want to miss me yelling at you about your kid's soccer schedule. I know that that's important to sweat with a group of people. (laughs) I know it's valuable to be in here. So, so be here. Serve one and attend the other. We've, we've made a decision to smash our services a little closer together to accommodate this. So when we come back together in two services, we're going to have one at 9 and we're going to have one at 1045 so that we're done at 12. That means the services will be an hour and 15 minutes long. You'll see a slight adjustment to the teaching and maybe a slight adjustment to the worship. Where you'll see the most significant adjustment is to the other stuff that we do kind of as we meet and greet and make announcements. We feel like there are other places where we can uh, do that. And so when we come together, we'll be coming back together in services that are an hour and 15 minutes. That means when you make the decision to serve on a Sunday and attend another, you'll be here from more like nine to noon and less like eight to noon. So we're trying to reduce that and smash those services together to hopefully make that doable because we know you wanna represent well, we know you want to serve, uh, we know you wanna get in the game. I know that some of you are gonna think, well, my, my kids just won't. And, And I want to humbly submit another thing to you since I've already offended you. And that is the statement, my my kids have not been led to. Don't so quickly say my kids won't, because I think there are a number of kids who do too. In fact, I know there's a number of kids who do too. So consider just the slight change. Instead of saying my kids won't, maybe adopt the I have not led my kids to do this and see if there's some creative way to pull this off. See if maybe you wouldn't serve with your spouse so your spouse could go home or maybe there's friends or grandparents that would be willing to take the kids so that you could sit in and under the word and participate in one of our services. Chances are your lack of participation is not a practical kind of schedule issue. Even if we smash the services, it's probably not gonna seal the deal for you. The issue is one of value. And when we think something's important, we get pretty creative and we pull it off. But when we think something's of little or no value, we're just not driven or motivated to do it. So I'm guessing that it's just actually not rewarding enough to serve one and attend the other. That maybe it's not an issue of kind of uh, schedule, um, but of, of, of value, 
And this question of value is one that we've been living in for years. Is it worth it? And why are we doing this is a question that dominated the pandemic. That's the question that led to this great resignation, this great migration. Whatever moves were made during the pandemic, they were made because someone was questioning the value of something. I don't think this is worth it. I don't think this is worth what they're paying me. I don't think this pays off. The cost is too great. And so because of it, we moved cities. Glad you're here. Welcome to Vizalia. Because of it, we moved churches. Glad you're here. Like genuinely, like the people I've talked to, it sounds like God used the pandemic to reposition people for mission. It's not just discontent, disgruntled people leaving churches. God did something during that time. We changed jobs, didn't we? Changed schools. We we moved towards certain ideologies. We moved away from certain ideologies. This is what happened because we were asking the question, "Is is this worth it? Is this valuable? And so I was pondering this just as there's a morning like, Travis, you have to cast vision for what we're, we're doing together. And then I had to ask, like, what are we doing together? And I was, I was tr- trying to come up with something maybe fresh, um, obviously inviting, something sticky that we could all latch on to. And you know where I landed? I didn't land on anything new, but I landed on something that's always been true about us. This is what we want. And this is why we do this. We want to see Jesus. We want to behold him. We want to see him in a way where we savor him. We want to fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. We want Jesus. And there's something to be seen about Jesus when we serve. And there's something we see about Jesus when we serve kids. And there's something that we see about him when we're gathered together with all the saints. There's something we understand about his love, the depth of it, the width of it. There's something that happens when we're together. There's something we receive from one another. And I submit to you, it's a bigger vision of who Jesus is. And we want to put his brilliance on display. We're not radiant as the result of our own efforts. We're radiant because we want to see him, sit with him, be in his presence, and then reflect him to others. We believe as image bearers, we were made to do that. We will put something out. We will put something off. We will reflect someone or something. And we want to put his brilliance on display by being obedient to God's word, living true to the truth that we know. And we want to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we want to be devoted to God's mission so that the lost are found. So that prodigals who left the church a long time ago come home. So that disciples are formed and then churches are planted. That's it. I got no, I got, I don't have anything new. That's why I'm still here. I still want to do this, except I don't want to do this. Isn't that true that in most of us, there's just competing desires where what we say we want is not always what we want. And most of us have come out of COVID-19 beholding, well, I don't know, what is it for you? Beholding uncertainty. Beholding uncertainty and putting people on blast. By being obedient to our flesh, I'd like to eat that, drink that, surrendered to cultural currents and narratives, and devoting to saving our own rears. This is the creep that's gone on in all of our lives. In my life, I've watched mission creep happen. Some of us have been beholding madness and putting up with Zoom school, putting Zoom school on the display. Seeing fear, seeing division, beholding selfishness and scarcity, beholding hatred, and not putting the brilliance of Jesus on display, but putting anger and blame on others. Putting out fires. What's been your mission statement? Putting on a smile. 
Seeing madness and putting on a smile. Seeing madness and putting posts on display. We've lived devoted uh, to being right. We've devoted ourselves to being isolated. We've devoted ourselves to survival. We've devoted ourselves to a, a show. We've been devoted to not getting a divorce. It's required some effort. And we can laugh or like cry about this stuff, but it's been true for most of us adrift. So I just want to call you back to beholding Jesus, seeing him, fixing your eyes on him, savoring him, staring at him, and then reflecting him, putting his brilliance on display. If we give only until it hurts. Can we put the brilliance of Jesus on display? Is it part, what are we reflecting when we give only until it hurts or only until it costs us? We're reflecting our culture. That's not a reflection of him. Our world won't know him. Can we put the brilliance of Jesus on display by being with one another? Until being with one another starts to feel like bearing with one another. And when we have to bear with one another, we're going to bail on one another. See you later. Good luck with that. Does that put the brilliance of Jesus on display? No. In order to put his brilliance on display, we're living to seek and save those who are lost. And we want to give even when it hurts, give even when it costs. We built this mission statement so that issues could be addressed and traced. So when the lost aren't being found here at the church, we go, huh, I bet we're not devoted to the mission. And then we go, huh, we trace it up to the top and go, there must be something about Jesus that we're missing because we're not reflecting him. We built this thing to when, we, when giving is down, we don't go, oh, it's because we trace it back to a down economy. We actually trace it back to, there's, there must be something about Jesus that we're missing. Let's see something about him and then let's reflect him again. Would you attend regularly? Don't miss. Would you give sacrificially like when it hurts, like when it costs, when there's a pinch? Discipleship is designed to cost, and there's no other way to put him on display than to move beyond that. Following Jesus is designed to cost. He's worth it. That's what worthy means. It's a fancy way of saying he's worth it. So here we go. I'm going to do my best to make a pitch. Is that okay? Radiant kids. Here's what's going to happen in the next 12 months. We're going to serve between 150 and 200 kids each and every week. Rather than just judge the next generation, rather than fret about the future of our kids, we're going to get in there, roll our sleeves up, and tell them about the God we know who's faithful and true and able to see them through. We're going to invest our lives in them and build relationships because that's the vehicle by which God does discipleship. So 200 kids each week are going to hear about Jesus, and they're going to learn from the scriptures. We're going to serve and support parents by giving them some time and some space so that they can get something to give away. You can't be pro-life and not be pro-kids ministry. This isn't about a one-time vote. This is about voting every day with our time and money. I'm all for voting pro-life, but would you vote it every day with what you do and with what you have? In the kids' ministry, we're going to flip and redecorate 10 classrooms to make spaces that are conducive to learning and exciting to be in. We're going to host over 300 dads, and they're going to dance the Macarena with their daughters at the daddy-daughter dance. We're going to launch 75,000 Nerf bullets. 300 mothers and sons are going to participate in our Nerf gun war We're going to install a new playground in the next month. 
We're going to produce dances again during the Christmas and Easter season. We're going to serve Highland Elementary, and we're going to make our way across the street to see how we can serve pro-youth. We're aiming to be staffed, fully staffed, with 250 people serving our kids. There are 28 different ways to do that. So don't just decide that you can't. Put your name in the hat and start a conversation with Cassie about this season of life and how you might be able to serve us. As the media team, in the next year, this sanctuary is going to get AC. Can I get an amen? That has nothing to do with the media team, but it's just kind of what I'm thinking about right now. You know what is coming is new overhead lighting and new lighting on the stage. For those of you who can't read your Bible here on Sunday mornings, you're welcome. There's new lighting coming in that the media team's going to oversee and design. New projectors are coming our way, and as always, kind of beautiful and thoughtful decor is something we're going to do. Every ministry in the church gets from the media team two special videos like the one we just saw about kids, and you can be a part of producing that. Every event's going to be artfully promoted, documented, and then celebrated in the church. And if that communication is valuable, join us. We're going to help communicate, and we're going to help recruit what's happening. And there's going to be tech support for all the media and the events and the services. And everyone in the body from the media team is going to receive slides that are on time. <laughs> so you're like, what? You're talking out your butt now. You know, no, no, I'm talking slides that are on time. We want to work to have effective, clear, and timely communication on all fronts. We want people to see and hear the good news. And when we come together, we want to be together. And the media team's a huge part of keeping together, even with sounds and slides. It's important. On our social media, we're going to put films up and out. The best of Radiant is going to be shared online, not just the announcements or the sermon archives. Everyone in the world, Forrest wrote this. This is pretty big. Everyone in the world because this is the World Wide Web. They're going to get access to world-class teaching. Thank you, Forrest. And worship that Radiant is known for. World-class worship. <laughs> On social media, they'll get access to our podcasts, access to the films, and really intentionally crafted content to help people navigate what they're currently facing and bring them into a relationship with Jesus and bring them into a relationship with his church. If that's exciting to you, sign up to be on this media team. We need 20 people to participate and bring their skill sets in order to accomplish this. How many of you love being a church downtown? All right. How many of, let me ask it this way. How many of you want to move to Caldwell and Acres? Then you have to sign up for the security team. You do, because we want this to be a safe place, and we want this to feel like a campus. And more than that, we want to be salt and light downtown. And more than that, we want to love our neighbors. And more than that, we want to serve on these streets. So sign up to be a part of a, our security team. The security team is actually the first point of contact that people make. Long before they get to these doors, the security team is pointing them in the direction that they go. These are peacemakers, here to receive, here to welcome, here to watch over what's happening. No experience is needed. You don't even need to know what an arm bar is or anything like that. You need to love people and love the church and love this community and love that we're downtown. Sign up to be a part of the security team with us. And last, our hospitality team. Our hospitality team is going to welcome and connect with people as they come through the doors, but they're also going to make sure that this is set up to receive people, that we have our guests 
in mind. Not only that, but they're going to fire up team casserole, which is essentially our meal train. So when people are going through tough times or surgeries, or there's been a death in the family, or someone's going through a transition, we're going to get the word out and we're going to bring meals to people's homes. We're going to set this place up so that we're ready to welcome people when they come in. If somebody, doggone it, if somebody puts their best pants on and braves it, and comes to a church hoping to connect with God and connect with people, we're going to connect with them. We're going to serve them. We're going to have them in mind. We're going to help them find a seat. If someone comes forward to take communion, we're going to make sure there's bread that they don't get to the front and go, I thought there were two pieces to this puzzle. We're out. We're going to have our guests in mind. We're going to have outsiders in mind. We're going to have others in mind. Because how else will we put the brilliance of Jesus on display? If we aren't ready to reflect the Father and run out and welcome the prodigal, how else will we reflect him? It's a joy to get to do this together. Will you pray with me? God, I just want to ask that anything... that is condemnation and not conviction from you uh, would fall off of people. I know it's no way to sustain anything in my life or in anyone else's. And I want to ask Jesus that your words and your call would be clear this morning. I want to ask Holy Spirit that you would move on people's hearts and in the day of your spirit that people would volunteer willingly. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for seeing us through this pandemic. And would you help us, help us open our hands. Help us give our lives away. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. I, I, I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave, divine.